Okay, good morning everyone. Um, so just uh, uh, before we get to the class notes that you have in front of you, we just uh, had one tiny section to wrap up from last class. And um, where we ended off with, you'll, you may recall that at, um, we started up here right at node zero and we branched and we had a rule that we will always branch on the non-integer variable when we solve the relaxed problem. So 0 0.44 over there is variable x4. And our rule was that we would just pick one of the two. In. And in our case, we chose that we would branch on the, on the one value. And then we, we went out here and we found our incumbent node. So that was a new term, incumbent. Um, node one had a value of z equals 14. And because that incumbent had a value um, of the relaxed solution that also happened to be integer, in other words, it's a feasible solution, um, <coughs> z is equal to 14, and so we can then stop right there. We don't even need to consider any of these further nodes below it. And so notice that just with doing two iterations, solving one relaxed problem at node 0, one relaxed problem at node 1, we've been able to eliminate half, pretty much half of the tree. We call that a cut, so you cut all of that out of consideration. You don't even need to go further down that branch. So we can't stop there yet, but notice that we've terminated for one of three reasons, that we've got an integer solution of the relaxed problem, a feasible integer solution of the relaxed problem. So that's our first termination reason. Then we come down here, look at node two, three, four. Notice that we dive right down the tree. We call that depth first search. And uh, Graham had a question last class about why do we just dive down? Why, what about not searching across? So in other words, here, instead of going from node 2 to 3 to 4, why don't we stand here at node 2 and evaluate both branches and see z there is 13, z there is 9.67. And so, well, hang on, we're trying to minimize why, instead of heading down the branch with 13, why don't we head down the branch of 9.67? Well, that's a, gr a great valid question. And that's what's called breadth-wise search. You first you stand at your parent node, you look at your branches, and you pick the best possible branch. That's a, that's a valid strategy. Okay? So what you'll notice is if you, if you look at various solvers, mixed integer solvers, that you can set which strategy you'd like to use. We've just picked one to teach in this class, but you could pick a different one. Um, let's just uh, finish up, though. When we got to node 4, we could terminate over there. Uh, we terminated there because that z value 17 is worse than our incumbent, so we don't even need to evaluate those first two. So there's the second termination region, reason. You terminate when your current relaxed problem is worse than your incumbent. Yes? Do you, can you specify whether to set your current, um, like, non integer variable to either 1 or 0, which one you pick first? Yeah, there's, all the solvers have a variety of settings that you can pick from. Okay, and so then when we were left off last class, we had moved up here back to node 2, down to 6, 7. We found our incumbent node 8. Then that z value is 12. It's better off than our current incumbent of 14. But we're not finished yet. We have, because we created a branch up here at 6 with a value of 9.67, there's a potential that this branch down here actually contains a lower value. So we have to at least come finish this up. When we get to node 10, we can evaluate it. We see that it's infeasible. And there's your third termination re reason. So if you go back to your notes from last class, you see there around paragraph 22. Um, I'll just pull it up there in case you don't have it. In the notes, I list during the notes, there's three reasons why you can terminate. Here's termination reason one. Further down, we got to termination reason two. And then here in this last node, we're experiencing termination three. You terminate when you can prove that that node is infeasible, then all the nodes below it will be infeasible as well. So there's no point heading down that, down that path. So what I wanted to, that essentially covers the entire branch and bound, bound algorithm. You keep branching and terminating until you've got, essentially, you've eliminated all possibilities, right? The, these x's here, you actually haven't gone and visited, but you know that you can exclude them from consideration. So notice that by the end of this, we've evaluated 0, 1, 2, 3, up to 10 nodes. So we've evaluated 10 linear programming problems. And there are 
29 possible nodes on this tree. You can verify that for yourself. And that is about 38% of the space was evaluated. Okay, so rather than trying to calculate every combination, I showed you last class that that quickly leads to days, months, years, centuries for very small problems. What this branch and bound routine shows you is that with following this idea, we can eliminate, in this case, we only had to evaluate 38% of all the possibilities. <coughs> in most practical problems, when you're dealing with a, with a good number of integers, that number is, is definitely less than 1%, and it's not uncommon that it's around 0.1% of all possibilities being evaluated. So that's how you can see where we can solve problems with tens, 50, 100, 200 integer variables in seconds can still be solved feasibly because we essentially never have to evaluate all combinations. We only will, with branch and bound, evaluate a very small number of nodes. So it's 1%, um, like 99% reduction? Of possible work that you could have done. Yeah, OK. So I just want to uh, quickly show you, and I've posted this code on the course website. Let's just pick one of these examples here. Um, I'm just going to take node 3. There at node 3 we have, remember we, we designated it using that partial type notation. Node 3 has x4 equal to 0. Node 3 had x2 set equal to 1. And nodes 1 and 3 are free variables. So node 1 and node 3 can be numbers that are lie between 0 up to 1. It's a continuous variable. So how did I solve that particular node and get a z value of 13 and find that the relaxed solution is 0, 1, 0 0.2, and 0? Well, in GAMS, what you would do then is just solve it as follows. So here's, the, here's my original problem. And all I do is I add in four constraints, <coughs> four sets of constraints. x4 I set to be equal to 1. So dot lo dot up for x4 is forced to, um, should be 0. OK, so x4 we're going to force to 0. x3 is allowed to float between 0 and 1. So the lower and the upper value is 0 to 1. x2 we're going to force equal to 1. So set the lower and upper bound equal to 1. And then x1 is free to float. And when you do that, then you can solve that and it should get out to giving you that optimal solution. So there's your optimal solution. Z is equal to 13 over there. And your relaxed solution is 0, 1, 0 0.20. 0. So that's how I generated the table that you had on the last page of your handout last class. I just ran this GAMS code with all those combinations for you. Um, but you can easily do this yourself. OK. so. So that really just wraps up branch and bound. And what I've done is I've posted another example on the course website. Uh, and I'll post the solution later today as well for you to <coughs> practice with another combination. I've got printed the table there for you. And you can work through it. <coughs> just uh, perhaps let me comment on uh, Mark's question there about the choice of ones and zeros and breadth first versus depth first search, which one would you pick? Well, the strategy that companies use, so for example here, I don't know if you picked up on it, but I, I, have, I have my MIP, OK? So what I can do then is I can tell GAMS which solver to use. And this particular solver that I'm using currently um, is whatever the default is. So let's go, go check for those of you that are, are working on your projects right now. You can easily go try a different solver by going File, Options. And under Solvers over here, I'm solving an MIP type problem. So anywhere where there's a square icon here is, is a valid solver. So I could go use Baron, for example. If I click on that now, Baron will become my default MIP solver. Or if I wanted to use Cplex, um, I would just click an X in there. So there's about seven or eight MIP solvers in in GAMS for you. So let's, let's just go use this one called MOSEC, for example. Hit OK. And now when it solves, um, I think it's going to use MOSEC file options. <coughs> Mo 
MOSIC, MIP. OK. Oh, I have to go back here. River Power again. So I'll talk about that line in a minute. That's a, a different way to specify your solver manually. Um, but here in the background, I'm going to use MOSIC now. And when I hit F9, the output is going to clearly indicate there I'm using MOSEC and it gives all the information about the solver, the version number. And then what you'll notice here in the output is, is terms that you'll recognize. Um, so further up here, it says the number of branches, number of cuts generated, number of relaxations solved. So all that terminology we've learned about over there. And if you go read the MOSEC documentation, for example, you can go specify whether it should use a depth or a breadth first. Um, some of the other solvers have different options you can specify. And what I've been saying to those of you that have been coming to me when we've been looking at GAMS code is you wouldn't just solve this once with one solver. You would solve your same problem with two or three different solvers and at the very least verify that you're getting the same answer between them. Okay, so don't just solve with CPLEX. Solve with two or three of the other solvers and compare the output um, as well. So MOSEC, for example, will tell you how many, how many relaxations it's solved. CPLEX will tell you some other information. So let's actually just go try that. I'm going to go solve this time now with CPLEX. And CPLEX's output tells me something very different. It's, it's less noisy, but it, it tells me about in the current incumbent value. So CPLEX finds the current incumbent of 14. That was what we had as well. And then after a few more iterations, it finds the incumbent value of 12. So again, all terms that you recognize here in this output. Okay, so, so please do that in your projects. Solve not only your one case or two, three cases that you're looking at, but also solve them with different solvers to see that at least they agree with each other. Okay, so let's, um, let's move on then. On, we've looked at, at the algorithm now. Let's go back to a few more problems that we can solve with, um, with this new type of thinking of binary variables. And um, perhaps let's just start with these two assignments. Of course, the course project you know is due next week, Monday, electronically at 4 o'clock. Um, all the assignment grades are, are posted up to assignment 5. The solutions are all posted up to assignment six, and by the end of this week, we'll get the grades and the solutions all posted for assignment seven. So you'll have everything available to you to start studying, and then a branch and bound algorithm uh, problem is posted for you on the course website for practice. And what I'll post as well are some practice problems for the final exam. Um, I know that we haven't had lots of new assignments since assignment seven, so that was about three weeks ago. So assignment questions, um, on the newest stuff, I'll, I will post for you to, to practice with. But there's, um, it's not for submission, obviously. There's no time to submit that assignment. OK, so that's coming up over the next few days on the website. So just note, look out for that. Let's look at then, essentially, at what will probably be the last type of problem we're going to consider in this course, is a scheduling problem. And these happen everywhere least of which is the one that, that is most relevant to you right now is the university scheduling of your exams or the scheduling of your timetable is something that you've dealt with over several semesters on campus. You can look at this as scheduling the workers that will work for you one day, your operators, your engineers, your colleagues. You may need to schedule a, uh, some work for them and how could you do that efficiently? You know of Gantt charts. And you're going to see these ideas of Gantt charts coming through here. Um, Let's just take a look, though, at the formality of setting up a schedule and solving it as an integer problem. And to do that, I'm going to start with the simplest of schedules, where you've got one, one piece of equipment that needs to do multiple product, multiple tasks. And in chemical engineering, the classical piece of equipment that has that nature is the batch reactor, one piece of equipment that creates many products. Um, Food industry, beverage industry, you would have seen, you will see these all over. The, um, one of the grad students here a few years ago worked for PepsiCo, Quaker, out in Peterborough, and solved a huge, huge scheduling problem on all their pieces of equipment to coordinate. Because it's not just one tank 
we were looking at the simplest problem now, just one tank. But now imagine a tank, a packaging line, a blender, a baking oven, freezers, inventory storage, and coordinating the sequence of that. And then there's requirements that something needs to <coughs> So for example, you need to blend before you go to packaging. And setting up these constraints and dependencies becomes really complex. So we're going to see already just on this simple single unit that we get already six constraints arising just from one unit. So let's build it up slowly and introduce some new notation here. We're going to say on that tank we want to produce a particular product and let's call them product one, two, or three. We can call them jobs, we can call them tasks. Task one, two, three, job one, two, three. The literature in this area uses the term job. So that's the, the language I'll use, but in the context of a batch reactor, it would be product one, product two, product three, job one, job two, job three. And we have on this Gantt chart, we can see here in this particular specification, let's start with <coughs> the lowercase d's. Job three is due at this particular vertical red line. Job two is due at that vertical red line, and job one is due at that vertical red line. So that's your end point, your due date. There's the duration of the task. So P1, P2, P3 is the, the processing time for that task. So the time spent in the batch, for example. The red arrow to the left is the release time. Now this is a, a, a strange concept at first, but some, t some jo batches have this idea of a release time that you can't start P3, you can't start processing job three until a certain time point. Okay, so that red arrow means that from that point onwards is when P3 can start. So let's take P1 as an example. P1 starts right next to the red arrow. That's the earliest you can start P1. P3 here starts a little bit later. It's got this gap. P2 also has a bit of a gap between its release time. So if you think of this, perhaps it might be that um, R3 is, that's the time when an operator is available from that point onwards. That operator arrives at that time and can start doing job three, but prior to that time, the operator might not be on shift, right? So that constraint might come there due to those reasons. Or R3 might be just that this time ahead of time is needed to prepare feed one, two, or three to go into the batch. There might be some prep time required for that. Okay, so those, those come in there. And when we're going to solve these problems, our search variables, the thing that GAMS is going to vary for us and try to, to change is the start times, xj. So visually what that means is, where do I slide this bar along left to right and place it? So P1 is placed right at zero. P3 is placed at this particular point, and P2 is placed at that particular point. So it's my starting time for the job. So let's, um, let's take a look at, at the simplest case first. I'm going to put up a small, a small problem here for you. And let's just look at the situation where we have a processing time and a due time. So let's ignore release times for now and just start with this very simple case. And the way you can visualize this is with a Gantt chart. So when we do scheduling, when we only have a processing time and a due time, I call this undergraduate scheduling. This is exactly what you do in your mind when you're scheduling your time. You know your due date, and you know how long it's going to take to do it. And so what do you do? You say, well, when's my last due date for task three is due at 36 hours from now, it's going to take me nine hours, so I'm going to start exactly nine hours before it's due. Okay, so let's, let's visualize that. Here's 36. So undergraduate student scheduling looks as starting job three right over there. It's going to take you nine hours and you're going to finish at 36 hours. Is this the same example, the 
Yeah, so you can see this is product three, for example. This product three takes nine hours to produce. It's due 36 hours from now. So you're going to start it at, at, 30, at nine hours just prior to the due date. Then you've got task uh, two, which is due 25 hours at, at t equals 25. So task two, you're going to start just over there. Task two is six hours in duration. Okay. And job one is due at 20 hours from now. It's going to take 15 hours. So you can see you've got a bit of flexibility in the schedule now here. Job one, you could either start at zero and it's going to take 15 hours, but it's only due at t equals 20. So you could, you could slide, this, <coughs> slide this over a little bit, right? If you were really wanting to procrastinate, you could slide job one over right up to t equals 20, which is going to be over here. So there's 20. Now you can't slide it all the way over because job two is going to take six hours. So working backwards, 25 minus six is 19. You could only slide this up, up to as far as 19. Okay. So you've got basically four hours of slack time or freedom built in there. You could either start job one at zero or you could start job one four hours later, finish it and then start job two right away, have a gap, and then start job three. Now, none of those ways are right or wrong. It's just you've got these jobs with these, with these due times, with these processing times. What this, it, what this Gantt chart representation shows, you've got some flexibility to move things left and right. And we're going to talk about what I want you maybe to start to think is what would be your objective function here? What would you try to maximize or what would you try to minimize when setting up this sort of schedule? Okay. So, now let's take a look at release time. Release time adds a, a little bit of extra complexity into this. Release time says, well, hang on, job one, which I'm still going to use the same numbers, but let's add release times to it. Job one can only be started five hours from time zero. Job two can be started only 10 hours from time zero. Job three, however, can start right away. Okay. So job three actually has the most flexibility. It's, you can start job three right away. It's due right at the end, and it takes, takes nine hours. So you could actually start with job three first if you wanted to, and then switch to job one, and then job two, or do job three, and then two and one. So you can now start to see this combinatorial idea build out. But let's just keep with the same, um, same order that we've used up to now. So sorry? We're going to come look at the order of the constraints in a minute. Or probably maybe even only on Wednesday. So we're just going to build this up really slowly. I don't want to rush through this um, because it introduces a lot of new terminology. So below this now, let's look at what release time does. Yes, before we do that, Fahima. Um, you said that you, want, you can start job three before job one and job two. But you need um, 15 hours for job one. And job one is due 20 hours. Right. So yeah, so then, then that well, then that, you're going to have to accept some lateness. And that's why I wanted you to start thinking of objective functions. OK, great. <coughs> so let's, let's look at what release time does. Release time says job one can only start five hours from now. So here's time zero, here's time five. So job one can begin from time five onwards. And it's going to take 15 hours. It's going to end right at 20. Job two can start from time 10 onwards. Well, we've already allocated job one here. So job two is actually not going to be affected by the release time condition. Right? So if, if I place job one right at the beginning, I'm already allocating from time zero to five is just waiting time. Five to 20 is processing job one. Job two can start right afterwards because we already meet the release time condition. So job two is six hours.
But what we're going to do, unfortunately, by, by allocating it that way is job two was due at time t25. We're now actually going to finish this an hour late. So we've added one hour of lateness with this current schedule. And then job three is going to take nine hours. I could stop, start job three right away. <coughs> okay, so, so this is going to then start at time 26. 26 plus 9 gets you 35. So at time T35, I finish job 1, 2, and 3 with one hour late on one of the tasks. Okay, so it's not wrong to be late. We can penalize it and you can add it in as maybe as an objective function to minimize lateness. And this particular allocation of tasks gets us one hour of lateness. As I said earlier, you could reorder these jobs and perhaps get zero lateness, but perhaps not. Okay, so that's what we're going to get the optimizer to set up. Now, the search variables that we're going to use in this particular case, if I had to code up my search variables, I'm going to say xj equals 1. The first job starts at 5. xj2 is equal to 20. And xj3 in this case is equal to 26. Okay, so what the optimizer is doing is it's varying this value of 5, 20, 26 so that it can optimize some objective function. So in other words, it's shifting these values left and right with the condition, of course, that xj must be greater than or equal to 0. That's clear. We've got to start from time 0 or afterwards. So what might be some conditions you would want to optimize. We've already looked at lateness. Anything else that you might think that you'd want to minimize or maximize in order to adjust these values of 5, 20, 26 to different numbers? So you want to tell the optimizer in GAMS, you're going to code up something in GAMS that says min or max. We're not quite sure yet. This is what we're what we're discussing is what goes in that box. What do you minimize or maximize by varying xj1, 2, and 3? Okay, so this is your search variables. What goes in that box over there? Any suggestions? Sure. You might want to maximize the from like the end product, the end time or the product in a few days, so that would be a change in the minus time. Okay, so sorry, minimize, maximize? The maximize the difference between like, uh, job one finishing and the due date of job one being due. OK, so maximize, I see, OK, the due date between the finishing time of the job and when it was due. So that you get a schedule that's got maximum flexibility, extra padding for room to move. OK, so there, that's an objective that you could use. Anything else that you might want to use? <coughs> Minimize lateness. Minimize lateness, we've seen that. So this schedule currently has one hour of lateness. Can we reduce it even further? Anything else? Brandon? Minimize total run time. So take, like, in other words, you want to bunch these up as close as you possibly can to the left so that one, job one, two, and three are finished you can start another cycle of job one, two, three, or whatever the order is, OK? So we call that completion time. <coughs> um, another suggestion, was it the same one? Similar? OK, so let's take a look at, at some. There's six <coughs> types of objectives that are, are currently used. Uh, Michelle's one is a little bit different from the six that are up here. But um, let's, and it's, it's, it's equally valid, but it's, it's not one of the typical ones out there. Let's see. And what I'm going to do here is we're actually going to calculate the numeric value of these six objective functions so that we can interpret what they each mean. What I've done here for you is I've given you 
new starting time. So ignore the 5, 20, 26 values that I've got over here. Let's use that task 1 is going to start at time 9, task 2 at time 24, and we're actually going to start with job 3 first. Okay, so maybe let's, um, it's helpful to visualize this. So whenever you deal with scheduling or using scheduling software, make sure the software has great visualization because that's the most efficient way of interpreting a schedule. So at time zero, this current schedule says we're going to start with job three. Job three lasts nine hours. Okay. Then we're going to say what about um, job one starts at time nine. So job one comes in right away. And job one lasts 15 hours. And then job two is going to come after that at time 24. And it lasts six hours. Okay, so here we're at time nine. And 9 plus 15 is 24. 24 plus 6 is 30. OK, do we obey the release time conditions? Job 1 has to start from time 5 onwards. Yep, we obey the release condition. Job 2 can only start from time 10 onwards. That release condition is also obeyed. <coughs> Job 3 can start right at time 0. The due time conditions. Are the due time conditions violated or not? Yes. No. Job one's due time is time 20 hours. Yeah, yeah job one violates the due time. Job two yeah. violates its due time. Job three does not violate its due time. Okay, so due times are not hard constraints. We're going to penalize it. So let's see how that happens. So calculate these six constraints. I'll give you, I'll give you a couple of minutes to sub in there. Okay, and the way to, to work with this is to actually just fill in this table. So completion time, let's work through perhaps the first one. Completion time is defined as the maximum of task xj plus pj. So take the starting time of the task plus its processing time. For j equals 1, j equals 2, j equals 3. So your first, let's just looking at completion 1, task 1, j1 starts starts at 9. So you'd have a value of 9 plus pj for task 1 of 15. So 9 plus 15 is equal to 24. So write uh, 9 plus 15 in that first box, the second box, and the third box, and then calculate the maximum of tho those three numbers, and then calculate the average of those three numbers. The, the largest of the three. Yep. So job one starts at time nine. It's 15 hours in duration. So nine plus 15 is 24. <coughs> job two starts at time 24. It lasts six hours. So it's completed at time 30. Job three starts at time zero. It's nine hours in duration, so it ends at nine hours, or completed with, within nine hours.
Okay, so the largest of those is 30. The average of those is 21. Okay. So let's let's interpret that quickly. Um, right at the top of this, of further up above the table, the maximum or the longest completion time is defined as the maximum of the three tasks plus their processing times. So 30 hours. And that 30 hours, we, we give a word called the make span, or that's what Brandon had suggested. They're the total time to run your cycle to completion of task one, task two, task three. Or in this case, we're doing three, one, and then two. Okay. You could also say, I would like to minimize the average completion time. So minimize the average of 24 plus 30 plus 9 divided by 3 is 21. So here's, here's the important point. We're trying to minimize these objectives. You want to minimize the maximum ta task or minimize the completion time or minimize the make span. All of those are equivalent statements. In other words, what the solver is going to do is it's going to resequence these jobs one, two, and three to find you the, m the shortest completion time or the shortest make span. If you set your solver to objective number two, the objective says to minimize to get the lowest average completion time. Let's take a look at objective three. Sub in that same that expression over there, the starting time plus the processing time minus the delay. And see what the interpretation there comes through as lateness. Okay, so the first task, let's calculate its lateness. It's the same part as before, 9 plus 15. This time only we subtract the due time. Task 1 is due at time 20. So if we get a positive figure, we're four hours late on that task. Task 2 is 24 plus 6. But it was due at time 25. So we were five hours late on that task. The first task, we started really early. It was only due right at the end, so we actually have a negative here, minus 27. So we're negative 27 hours late, or in other words, we're 27 hours early with that task. So now you can see how a reasonable objective function would be to minimize the maximum lateness. Okay, let's pay attention to that. When we have these sorts of dual objectives, we want to minimize the maximum lateness. It's kind of like in process control. You want to minimize the worst possible behavior or, minimize, or maximize the best possible behavior. Here we're trying to do the minimum of the maximum. Minimize the maximum lateness. So the largest lateness is five hours is what we'd like to minimize. Or we can take the average. The average lateness in this particular case is minus six. Okay, so let's take a look then and the last two pair five and six, so all of these go in pairs, the maximum and the average, the worst and the average. Let's take a look at the last condition is a new term that we see in um, scheduling called tardiness. Tardiness is idea of sluggishness and all that tardiness does is says, well, hang on, kind of like Ihima pointed out, well, can you have a negative lateness? Well. Tidiness simply says being early isn't a problem, so don't penalize being early. If you're early, just put a zero there. So this is the maximum of zero 
or 4, which is 4. If you look at this definition, the same term that's here in this bracket is the same term as up there. So maximize that or pick the worst of the 0 or that term. So maximum of 0 or 4 is 4. Maximum of 0 and 5 is 5. But notice here that when we try to maximize the max of 0 or minus 27, we get 0. Okay. So tardiness simply says being late isn't being late is a problem, being early is not a problem. So it doesn't penalize lateness. Uh, sorry, it doesn't penalize being early, it only penalizes being late. And so here in this case, your maximum again is five, but this time your average tardiness is um, let's see, it's the average of four and five and zero, that's nine divided by three. So your average is three. Okay, now what you probably notice here is if you try to minimize the maximum tardiness and you get a value of 5, it's the same as minimizing the maximum lateness. Right? They're this, solving one solves the other. So these six objective functions aren't unique in, in, in each way. They're, they're just focused on different parts of the problem. But the optimum for minimizing maximum tardiness is the same as the optimizing, optimizing of the minimum of the maximum lateness. So again, when people schedule, they don't just schedule for one of the six objectives. They will schedule for two or three of them and compare the schedules on their, on their Gantt chart. So again, great visualization. So whenever you see these in, in student reports or in theses or in, in companies that do this, they'll put the two schedules side by side. And, un and try to understand which, which one works better for them or not. Now, let's just quickly talk about solving this practically. If you look at this objective function, we're trying to minimize the maximum of something or we're trying to minimize the average of something. That's a linear problem. This objective function is linear. My decision variables are, what's the nature of my decision variables here? Binary, continuous, discrete, integer. What are my search variables? Devin? <coughs> They're continuous, right? There's, I happen to get values of 0, 9, and 24, but it could have been if my job durations were, let's say this was 9.5 hours then that would be 9.5 and my decision variables would be continuous. So these decision variables, these xj's, are not binary, they're not integer, they're continuous variables. My objective function is linear. Why are we studying scheduling in the binary section of the course? This is a pure LP. Nothing up to now has made this an integer problem. Okay. OK, you can't complete two jobs at the same time. If you ran this now in GAMS as is, and you said, I want to minimize the average completion time subject to varying xj's, what is it going to do? It's going to push all three right here at 0. Push job 1 over here and job 2 over there. And it's done exactly what you've asked it to do. It's minimized average completion time. Okay, so you need to tell GAMS in some way that, well, hang on, you can't run two or more jobs simultaneously. You can only run one job at a time, and that's where the binary nature get, comes in. So let's try to understand that, and one way we can enforce that is at the bottom of the page two. We're trying to bring this in, and there I've stated it in English, and I'm going to ask you to try and write it out mathematically. Okay, so let's, let's just work through one of these examples. I'll just take, um, take the first case. Let's just use the fact that j equals 1. So it says the start time of job j plus the processing time <coughs> must be less than the start time of any other job j prime, j dash. 
So let's take just this as an example, and let's see if what's written there in English actually makes sense before we even head to the mathematics. So start time of job one is currently set at what? It's up here. Start time of job one is nine hours, right? Yeah, everyone with me? Plus processing time for job one is 15 must be less than or equal the start time of any other job. Let's take job two, J prime two. Job two starting time is is 24. Does that constraint make sense? Yep, no, yes it does. 9 plus 15 is 24, so that constraint is valid. Okay. Let's try, well let's complete this up. Let, well maybe first let's try the other j dash. So j dash must not be equal to j, so let's try this for the case of j equals 3. So j equals 1 and j dash is equal to 3. So what does that constraint look like? Job 1, starting time, plus process, processing time is 9 plus 15, must be less than or equal to, what's the start time of job 3? 0. Okay, that doesn't make sense. This constraint is not valid. Which is why we need the second half of it. It's not just that you need the first constraint. It's the first constraint must be valid or the second constraint must be valid. The first half must be valid or the second half must be valid. OK, so let's complete that up then. We've, we're looking at just over this part over here. That's the first half of the constraint. Well, let's look at the second half of the constraint. The second half of the constraint is or the start time of job j prime, this time 3, plus its processing time must be less than the start time of job j. So it's flipping it around. The or part says in this particular case that job j dash 3 starting time is 0. Job j dash 3 processing time is 9. Must be less than or equal to the start time of job j job 1. Job 1 starts at time 9. Okay, so notice here that you need both conditions. Either this constraint is valid or the other constraint is valid. Okay. Okay, so So this is going to be a little bit confusing. I'm seeing some people helping each other out, and that's great. So what I want you to do then is, is try this out. This is how we express it mathematically. <coughs> mathematically, we can say xj plus pj must be less than xj dash. So start time plus processing time must be less than the start time of the other job. Or the v shape is the or symbol. or xj dash, the starting time of the j dash, or j prime job plus the pj prime must be less than xj. Okay, so messy, messy, and especially so when you're seeing this for the very first time. It's actually intuitive. The way that you can make it intuitive is by filling out this table. Now, if I had three, four minutes left, I would make you do this in pairs where one person does the first three rows and the other person does the next three rows but here's your homework is to do it yourself because we don't have that time left, is go sub in j values of 1, 2, 3 as I've written over here on the left for this constraint or that constraint and then you should see that if this one is not valid, this one will be. Or if this one on the left is valid, the one on the right will be invalid. So at least the entire row will always be a valid pair of constraints. Okay. So this is where we will start out. Uh, Brandon had a quick question. Yeah, what we're going to see is that this table actually has double the amount of work. 
right? There's you've replicated all the constraints twice. So what we're going to do is we're going to pick up on that and do this more, more, um, more efficiently next time. But if you don't do this before Wednesday's class, Wednesday's class is going to start off really confusing. So we'll pick up on this on Wednesday's class. We'll end earlier on Wednesday and then do also a short review of what we've covered in the course to wrap up the class.